All right. So I've made a point not to talk about Tim Donahue on my podcast, um, including not having him as a guest. I was surprised other shows have had him on because I don't feel like there's a lot of substance in what he talks about when he was a basketball referee. There was a podcast a couple years ago that uh, our guest, Sean Patrick Griffin, was on that I thought missed a lot of stuff. I thought it hit a couple things, but for the most part, it was called Whistleblower. And I'm like, I'm not promoting this. I'm not promoting Donahue. I'm out. And then this Netflix doc happened. It's part of the Untold series. It's about Donahue. And um, a lot of people have mentioned it to me. And my fear, it's 2022 September, that Donahue's attempt to spin his version of the events from 2003 to 2007 are now becoming the mainstream narrative of the event. So whatever he's been trying to do since 09 is working. Fortunately, we have Sean Patrick Griffin who is a professor professor of criminal justice at the Citadel. And for our purposes, I think the number one student of the Donnie thing, he wrote a book called Game in the Game in 2011, which wasn't about Donnie. It was actually about uh, Jimmy Batista, but there's a lot of Donnie stuff in it. You've been following it. You've been calling it out. There's YouTube clips, there's Twitter stuff. You're not like this deranged person. You're just like, wait a second, what is happening here? And I'm sure, were you more horrified by the Netflix doc than I was or uh, the same? No, I was more. And I'll tell you why, though, Bill. I think these things are awful because if people knew that they were entertainment, okay, that's fine. But it's presented as the story of the NBA betting scandal. And the problem is the public isn't told. It's actually Donaghy's version of the NBA betting scandal. And, and the reason I say it's, I really have a problem with this is because this one's different. They literally had access to all the key parties. They had access to the pro gambler, Jimmy Batista the mutual friend, Tommy Martino, the FBI supervisor, Phil Scala, who I would love to talk about. Um, And they selectively edited the interviews to craft Donaghy's narrative. And at best, the people who've looked at it said, well, maybe it's just a he said, he said, he said story. It's not. My issue is- We we have actual evidence. Yes, yes. People are pretending that we're in the fog of war back in 2007, and that's not it at all. Right. And and that's my real issue with this. And it's worked. Like, yeah. kudos to Donahue because whatever version he's tried to spin, I think has succeeded to some degree. You mentioned, like, what is, what's the intention? What is the spirit of a documentary, right? This has gotten really messed up over the last few years where we've seen either people producing their own documentaries and with athletes and singers where they're also the EP on it. I call them documercials where it's like, it's not really, a documentary means we're supposed to be factually accurate. We're supposed Mm -hmm. to have real journalism in this. Um, There's supposed to be some sort of balance. And this untold thing, first of all, the series is called Untold. Everything in here has been told. Was there not, was there one revelation in this documentary that you've heard? Because I didn't hear anything. Honest to goodness, not one. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but I actually spoke with the producers months and months ago. And I actually got in a chippy conversation with one of them and I said, Based on what you're telling me, the show is called Untold, but nothing is untold. Well, turns out I was correct in my assessment based on what information I was being given. So to recap for the audience, I just, uh, we could do this really fast and then we can get into some nuts and bolts. Donahue makes it seem like this was only one year of gambling, the 2006, mm-hmm. 2007 yes. season, and that he was basically threatened by the mafia <laughs> <laughs> to continue in the, at this ambiguous December 12th Marriott meeting that he wanted to get out and they threatened him and he had to do it or they were going to basically kill his family. The people, of course, that were threatening him were these two mobsters who weren't even mobsters. One of the, one of the people you wrote about, Batista, the meeting I, w- pretty clearly did not happen. But more importantly, he was betting on games starting in 2003. And this was the fourth, either the fourth or the fifth year of him gambling on basketball. And the narrative has always been he didn't bet on games that he was refereeing. All of the evidence says the contrary, all of it. Well, he was not only betting on his own games. And by the way, I thank you for what you just said, because the public has gotten this wrong. And as you know, if you follow me on Twitter, I, I've really been upset at the media. People think I'm upset at Donnie. I don't care that a convicted felon is telling tales. I'm a criminologist with a law enforcement background. That's sort of my stock and trade. I'm used to that. I'm not used to people giving people giving someone like Donnie a microphone and say, tell us what happened and accepting it as the truth. That's just ridiculous. But regardless, with regard to Donaghy, yes, he was betting on his own games at least. He only admits to betting on games he officiated going back to 03. 
straight through 06. And yes, then there's the infamous meeting at the Philadelphia International Marriott, December of 06, which he paints as the mob. But what the public doesn't realize, the mob actually was his best friend, Tommy Martino, and their mutual friend, Jimmy Batista, the pro gambler. And the reason the meeting happened was because Donaghy was upset that the person with whom he was betting from 03 to 06, Jack and Cannon, just a regular guy, an insurance salesman, Donaghy complained that Jack and Cannon was losing money down Atlantic City and not paying him. And in case you're saying, well, where is Griffin getting this idea? Well, from not only Batista, but Tommy Martino cooperated with the FBI. And yeah. that's what he told the FBI. And by the way, that's why if people would wake up, no one was charged with extortion in this case. There was never a mention of organized crime by the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn. It was never treated as a racketeering conspiracy. The only reason we're talking about organized crime is because Donaghy wants you to. Right. And what he was really guilty of was being one of the dumbest businessmen of all time because he, he struck a deal with the, uh, with the gamblers where every time he gave them a correct win, he got $2,000. And if it lost, he got nothing. What he didn't realize, because he was an idiot, was once it was out there that, let's say he's influencing the games in some way that he's refereeing, that got out there and now millions and millions of dollars are being bet on his game. And you chronicled this, ESPN the magazine chronicled this three years ago. The way the lines moved on the Donahue games, especially in 06, 07 season when they could really track yeah. it, yeah. does not add up. It, 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 it cannot be accounted to like a coincidence. A oh, no, 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 no. The lines are moving <laughs> two, two and a half points on these random basketball games. And he's winning, people think, like 78 to 80% of the time. And it's there's just no way he wasn't influenced in the games that I can find. Well, no, no, no. Look, if people look at the appendix to gaming the game, I purposely walked the people through the betting lines. I got all the betting lines for the relevant seasons. I had access to Batista's betting records. And don't forget, the professional gamblers cooperated with the FBI. The public is totally unaware that there's an entire cast of characters they've never heard of that bet on these games starting in 03. The only reason they were betting on the games was because they saw the lines moving on games Donaghy officiated. And Bill, your audience should know something. Donaghy's claim was always that he had quote unquote inside information and that's why he was betting successfully. And his argument was that he could bet equally on games he didn't officiate as those he did. And look, if inside information was the reason, that would make sense. There is not only no evidence of that, there's evidence to the contrary. First of all, all the people who cooperated with the government agree with what I just said. They only were betting on Donaghy's games. The betting lines were only moving on games Donaghy officiated. And more to the point, when you get to the 06, 07 season, which is what you just said, the reason the lines started moving even more, when Batista cut his deal with Donaghy in December of 06, he said, look, I'm a professional gambler. The way we make our good money, our big money, is manipulating the lines around the world. Well, the market starts in Asia, which is 12 or 13 hours ahead, filters through Europe, which is six or seven, so that by the time we bet on them in the East Coast, we've moved the line successfully. So they're going to bet $100,000, dollars $300,000 $300, overseas on the wrong side of the line, get the lines to move, and then they're going to hammer it with two or three million on our shores here. And they told Donaghy, you got to get those picks in the night before because we need to have time to move the lines. Those were only happening on Donaghy games. And that's why in 06, 07, the lines start even, moving even more. And by the time you get to like February, March, 07, the word is out that Donaghy's fixing games. Everyone knows. The, yes. People, people who have no idea about the actual nuances of the conspiracy, they're just watching the lines and copying them. And it becomes a snowball effect because then the sports books have to keep moving the lines. Well, it's even bigger than that because like our friend Haral, Bob. Yeah. He's a professional gambler at that point. And one of the advantages he had <laughs> was he was tracking referee behavior with the games. Yeah. And he notices like some really things that just jump out on these Donahue games. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to be like, all right, so this behavior, there's way more fouls. There's all, like mm -hmm. distorted calls where one team's getting called for 18 fouls, the other yes. team's getting called yeah. for three. So that's happening in these games where the line's moving by three points. Hmm. Yes. And right. the word and is out. Yes, and that's and that's what happened. By the way, with regard to the whole idea that the mob visited Donaghy in December of 06, he, the, your public doesn't know this. Donaghy's argument is that he would he didn't want to be part of this at all, but the mob made him do it, and that he was relieved when the pro gambler Jimmy Batista went into drug rehab on March 18, 2007, because the mob no longer. And he says this in all the interviews; they didn't have the grips of organized crime in him any longer. 
Well, what the public doesn't know because the media won't tell them. And this, you don't need access to Sean Patrick Griffin's still, files. That he was still betting with exactly. another better? It's, it's in the public record. Exactly. He starts <laughs> yeah. betting now with another professional gambler named Pete Ruggieri, who also cooperated with the government. Right. And if you look at Ruggieri's agreement and you look at Donaghy's agreement and Martino's agreement, their plea deals go through April of 2007. Batista's go through March. For that reason, he went in, he was done. But the scandal continues. And then when Ruggieri shuts the scheme down because he realizes the lines are moving too much and he can't get his edge because he's no longer in control of the lines, he shuts the scheme down. And what happens? Donaghy complains to Martino that he wants one more game. And this is the guy that your audience has been told for a decade from almost everybody in sports media and now the Whistleblower podcast and this ridiculous Netflix special that, no, he didn't want to be doing any of it. There's that great line in the Netflix special. If Batista hadn't threatened you, would you have done this? No, absolutely not. I mean, it's all ridiculous. It's demonstrably false. Well, then he he's crafted this narrative over the last 13 years that because he was a referee and he was under the hood with the league, he knew about all these different rivalries and he knew like yeah. that Dick Pavetta... You know, look, his games were more blowouts that Steve Javi and Allen Iverson had this blood feud that Joey Crawford loved Allen Iverson. That uh, we, one of the things he said was he would call the, he would do the home away game with, when he would call in on the bets. Yeah. yeah and he yeah. would basically be like, mom was the home team in the way. Like that, yeah. they would change it. Yeah. And the Netflix special never asked, like, A, can we just look up this stuff and see if this is true or not? Exactly. All the work has been done. Like all of these yeah. things that he said, these edges that he had, they didn't actually bear out during the games that they bet. That's one. Then the other one with the home away thing, what game? If you're betting on all these different basketball games and you just say home away, that's, yes. that's your code. Obviously you're talking about your own game. Exactly. Exactly. But nobody brings this up. I don't, I'm just like stupefied by the story. Well, I, and this is cathartic for me because, you know, people have gotten upset at me on Twitter, especially because I keep trying politely to correct people on the historical record. And I'm not debating this. Like, there's a great example. Again, you don't need access to all the sensitive information I did when I wrote Game of the Game. But all the work just, is on the internet. You did the work. Yeah. ESPN had a, had a piece, Henry Abbott did in 2009. Did, there's yeah. another piece, ESPN the Magazine 2019, that lays all this out. You can see all the data. It exists. Yeah. And that, that's the thing. I, I just don't get my Bill, my argument all along because I've spoken to so many people about this over the years. Don't forget, I speak publicly, so I deal with audiences all the time. What happens routinely is I can debunk this, 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 and that with facts. I'm not even debating it, you know. And they'll say, "Okay, fine." I, I actually wanted to create a website, yeah, but dot com, because they go, "Oh yeah, yeah, but they're so desirous to believe the conspiracies that are pre." existing in their heads that they'll ignore the demonstrable falsehoods and go, okay, fine. Those are BS. But man, that one, I knew that was always true. And that's what he says. It's confirmation bias on steroids. Well, I remember when, when his book came out in 09 and it was going to dive into some of like, uh, you know, first of all, he played the 02 finals card or Western finals card, which was smart. He played the 05 Mavs Spurs series, which was smart or Mavs rockets. Um, but it was about like, hey, some of these guys have biases against certain players, which is something I had been writing about on page two for a while. I always had a running joke about Dick Bavetta. He was the guy they needed in. He was like a wrestling. I would joke about this, but I like 10, 20% believed it. So I was like, oh, this book's going to come out. He's going to take us under the hood of how this stuff works. It, everything else was so I, it, distorted, I, like manufactured, whatever that I just couldn't take any of that stuff seriously after I read it because he was in such a fantasy land about what he actually did. And it seems like he still is 13 years later. Well, why wouldn't he be? It works. I mean, it, people don't know about me. They really do. They don't know about Game in the Game. They know about Donaghy's story. And, you know, the, the thing with all that, look, like you said, Henry did it. Bob Volgaris did There have been a bunch of people who have been doing this over the years. Um, so I don't know. It's a shame. It's very frustrating. It's, I, I as always, I as always say, I'm tilting at windmills. Um, the Scott Foster calls. Yeah. Well, are, are kind of the elephant in the room in this because mm -hmm. you did some of the work in your book that the gamblers actually bet on a couple of Scott Foster games and lost. So they kicked, kicked those yes. bets to the curb. There's a lot of phone calls. 
that are really con- continue to be unexplained that Donahue would call Foster. They would have these brief calls before mm-hmm. games. And I guess the story coming out of that was, oh, they were just, they're just really close. They're buddies. But if you do all mm-hmm. the Donahue work, this guy seems like a terrible friend. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, I, right. I don't know why anybody would have wanted to be close friends with him. And the theory that I'm just saying is a theory, I'm just espousing this, is people wonder, was Foster getting information from Donahue because he wanted to piggyback his bets. Right. Well, it's a theory that, that, of course, was not covered in the Netflix documentary. That, well, and, and if people watch the documentary, that's one of the things where they see the pro gambler was saying that he didn't understand why the NBA didn't do any research. So when Batista, the gambler, talks about a cover-up, he's not talking about any of the nonsense Donnie's talking about. He's talking about that issue specifically, which is, to our knowledge, nobody, including, <laughs> including the FBI, nobody has ever because, don't forget, the FBI originally bought Donaghy's BS. He was the first person to approach them. Four FBI field offices researched his claims about all the NBA conspiracies. Well, stuff. and they weren't basketball guys, so they and didn't exactly, really know what to right, look right, for, right? Right, yeah, exactly, yes. Which, by the way, I'll, I could also talk about how they reviewed Donaghy's game tape in a moment. But with regard to that, they, of course, traveled the country. One of the guys told me a funny line was, I wish the taxpayers realized how much of their money we wasted tracking down his nonsense. Well, with regard to that, with Foster, yes, they bet a few of his games and they they kicked him to the curb. Batista argues no one ever researched, including the FBI, whether because they didn't really weren't sure of Donaghy fixed games, whether Foster was picking back in the games. And we certainly don't know if the FBI, uh, pardon me, if the NBA rather, also investigated whether Foster was actually betting on Donaghy's games. Everyone well, was listen, looking at Foster fixing w- games. So that's a separate issue. Yeah, we're not accusing one way or the other, but what they didn't look at is after he talked to Donahue, what was his next call? Yes, well, that's What was his call an hour later? Right. And that's what they didn't investigate. Well, and that, again, that's what Batista's argument was. Don't forget, Batista's a hustler. And so for him, it made made no sense that people with access to this information wouldn't be trying to figure out a way to use it. And so that's what we'll never know. But anyway, see, I'm not making any allegations either. I'm just saying that to our knowledge, that was literally never even pursued. It's just never been answered correctly. I yeah. still do not, all these years later, 15 years later, understand why Donahue and Scott Foster would have very short calls over and over again during the NBA season when we now know that Donahue was a crooked ref. The, yeah. the Whistleblower podcast, which I thought really missed so much stuff, and I'm sure you were as frustrated with it as I was, they did hit one thing that I think is really fascinating in a piece that got lost in history with this is that they come to Stern. They tell him he has a crooked ref. They tell him who it is. Um, and their thought is, I, I actually don't know what their thought is because they're also trying to groom Donahue to basically take them on to find out if there are more crooked refs, right? They want to mm-hmm. see how far this goes. But they tip off Stern. They tell him he's upset. And then all of a sudden, the New York Post has the story two, three weeks later. And the podcast was pretty, pretty uh, adamant at pushing the theory that Stern tipped off the New York Post because he wanted to blow up the investigation. Do you believe that was true? I actually don't have an opinion on that. But just so you're clear here, don't forget, they're not looking for other referees fixing games. They're believing Donaghy's argument that the NBA is dictating game outcomes. Mm. That's that's the rabbit hole they're going down. So when they say that they want to wire him up or what, and by the way, I shouldn't even say that. When we say the FBI, you're hearing the words of the FBI supervisor of the unit, which housed the investigation. Yeah. Your audience probably has never heard the names Paul Harris and Jerry Conrad. They're actually, Paul Harris was the case agent, that's FBI lingo for the lead agent, and Jerry Conrad was his partner. They know more about this case. They'll forget more about it than you and I'll ever know. And yet the public doesn't even know their names. That's a problem. And I can't wait for them to retire so they can finally speak publicly about Mm. this. Scala, because he's retired, he gets the mouthpiece and he gets to say things like, oh, well, we were dying. He also says, by the way, in the whistleblower podcast, he wanted to go into the NCAA. Well, is he really alleging that the scandal had referees fixing games in the NCAA. No, he's talking about the idea that leagues are dictating outcomes. And there's no evidence of that. And well, so I don't the, care if, if you're an FBI supervisor or not. I mean, we're all welcome to our own conspiracy theories. But the idea that leagues are dictating outcomes. Yeah, look, people like me would love something like that. But there's no evidence of it. And the league wanted this to go away. 
That was their well, big goal. Agree, that, yes. They had an investigation that I don't even, the Pedowitz investigation which I think missed a lot of stuff, obviously. And then Stern was like, well, we've studied this. We investigated yes, this. Yes. It was one ref. Yes. And yet, even though he, did, he didn't bet on it, he didn't fix his own games. They said all that. But if you read between the lines, which is something you did really well in the last part of your book, they didn't rule out that he influenced his own games either. They didn't come out and say, we yes. have done all the homework. He did not do this. They left it ambiguous and they've left it ambiguous ever since. Well, wait, Bill, it's even worse than that because in response to the ESPN, the magazine article you referenced, the NBA put out a statement because the ESPN article by Scott Eden wrongly said that the NBA concluded he didn't fix games. The NBA immediately issues a statement and says, we never concluded he didn't fix games. And and in fact, David Stern, when he was alive, he was deposed in one of the hearings when legal, when the sports legalization uh, issue was being resolved. And he was asked by one of the senators and he says under oath, no, we never concluded he didn't fix games. So they're on record saying that there weren't, they never concluded he didn't fix games. But to your point, it's good business. And the thing is, even with that TV deal that's referenced in the Netflix documentary and it's referenced in the whistleblower podcast, there's a difference between realizing there's this Wait, you got to th- explain that TV deal and oh, then, sorry, yeah, then sorry, do your sure, point. Sure. Yeah. All right. So the allegation is that the NBA had this big TV deal on the verge of being cut. Their new rushed- media rights deal. Yeah, yes. it's coming. And, and, and they're going to rush it, though, because they now realize this Tim Donaghy thing is brewing and they're going to get this out of the way. Well, two things about that. First of all, that doesn't necessarily mean it's conspiracy. It might just be good business. That's number one. But number two, you can actually, it's 2022, you can reach out to all the media partners and ask them, hey, did you, do you think you guys got shafted here? Do you think that you got, you know, would you have done this if you had known? Yeah. Why are we even talking about the NBA? You can actually approach these things. And in 2022, look, there are ways for people to get access to people like you or anybody yeah. who's prominent in the media, if they, even if without being noted, being named, you can get your word out if you're upset about something. And we've, we have no evidence of that. It was a really rough time for the league. And I wrote about it a lot at page two because I, there just wasn't a lot of people writing about it. From 99 to 07, there were just some really strange playoff series, right? There there, there just was. Like the the Bucks and uh, Sixers won in 2001, which got swept under the rug of history, is really strange. Some of the Knicks stuff, like the four-point play with LJ, the 02 finals was, or Western finals was the worst one, Lakers-Kings. But on down the line, and this was a narrative with everybody who cared about the league and talked about it, leading to the 06 finals, Mm -hmm. when Wade turns things on Dallas, they win in six. The calls are horrendous in game three and game five. I wrote a whole piece about how it was an official officiating crisis that Cuban then put on his his, uh, (laughs) blog was like, I I love this piece or something like that. So then the Donna thing... Thing happens in 07 and it really did feel like it was a crisis so I understand like they wanted this to go away mm-hmm. I, I just think it's been glossed over how much havoc he wreaked that season and well, my the, FBI is, did, the FBI didn't look, know what to look for right you mentioned it before like they don't yes. know what they're studying it could only be a, he's correctly interpreting some of the calls yes. right yes. but it's stuff like oh, I'm going to call two fouls on Andre Iguodala at the beginning of the third quarter of this game now he has four they have to take him out and now the right. Sixers, he's their best scorer. It's little stuff like that. It, it could only be like two calls that can, mm-hmm. what did Batista yeah. say? Swing at six points? Well, that Martino actually said that. Or Martino. The issue is the, the pro gamblers, when I interviewed them back in 07, 08, they told me that they knew right away what he was doing. Their argument was he was calling technically correct calls that are never called. And he was calling them in the right strategic way, as you just suggested, whether it's palming, illegal defense, things like this. And Donaghy, he correctly says, I was one of the highest rated referees. Well, he was. And he also was notorious for calling more calls than everyone else. Well, if that's how you're fixing a game, well, yeah, that's not going to get picked up. And to your point about the FBI agents, this is not a knock against the FBI agents, but having a handful of FBI agents look at game tape, well, I mean, how would they know what to look for? And there's a bigger point to that. Donaghy told the FBI he didn't know what games he bet. Well, stop right there. Well, if you're the FBI, at what are you looking? And beyond that, if you don't know the games, well, A, you don't know what side he picked, and then you certainly don't know the betting lines and the betting propositions. So that whole endeavor was a waste of time from the beginning. And the only thing I wrote in Game in the Game as a criticism of the the FBI was, 
They didn't have access to Batista, the gambler, or to his electronic betting records, which I, which I did. Fine. But those betting lines are public. You don't need court, uh, you know, court record. You don't need a, a search warrant or anything like that for those. My argument all along was if they had the betting lines before they ever talked to Donaghy, they could have explained to him, hey, look, there are these odd patterns. You can say whatever you like. The, you know, the data is the data, you know, like yeah. that would, that would have been very helpful. And they just never did that. They didn't know. And incidentally, when, when game in the game came out, I had already been dealing with the FBI guys for the last couple of years. They were learning from me as much as I was learning from them because they just, they didn't know. And the public doesn't need to know this. This were the FBI guys were an organized crime squad in Brooklyn. They weren't prepared for a white collar gambling case in the suburbs of Philly. And they weren't <laughs> fond of traveling two hours down all the time to go research right. this. And it was just a nuisance case to them. And once they realized that Donaghy would plead guilty to at least subconsciously influencing games because he had a financial interest, and Martino pleaded guilty, and Batista was willing to plead guilty, they were willing to say, okay, look, we're never going to be able to prove to a jury whether a referee fixed games or not, and it's, uh, we're, we're done. That was literally the extent of this. Uh, and, and the FBI got, and I quote them in the book, they, this was not a big deal to them. It's yeah. a big deal to me. It's a big deal to sports fans. But to the FBI guys who are doing like mob cases and murders, this was a nuisance. Well, one other thing he did, and I can't remember who said this in your book. I think it was one of the other guys, not Donahue, but he could influence the other guys. So he's there with the three refs and they said he was a little devious. He would plant certain things because he felt <laughs> like he could almost subconsciously sway the other refs and be like, oh man, I'm not falling for the Iverson barreling right. into the guys tonight and just so even if the refs didn't realize it and then he could also you know he he had some feel from being on the road at least like you know from the players things he overheard like he had like little inside information that people like you and I wouldn't have but mm -hmm. the facts are the facts we at least have those 07 games but if you go back what what was con one of the confusing things was why didn't we have more info from 03 to 06 on well, the stuff that he bet well, a couple of reasons. First of all, don't forget, back then, the pro gamblers are waiting for Tim Donaghy's friend, Jack and Cannon, to place his bets. Mm. So they're sometimes they're getting them late, so they can't really move the market the way they want. So they can only get so much down. You know, so it wasn't until the 06, 07 season, they kind of oh, fixed that, did it way earlier. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. And then they could really go crazy. Yeah. So like up until then, that, and that, like I say, when they met in 06, that was, and by the way, going back to the Donaghy allegations, if you look at what the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office says, they describe that infamous mob meeting at the Philadelphia International Marriott. Uh, the feds actually write in Donaghy's plea deal, in Donaghy's plea deal, that uh, they had arranged a meeting. It wasn't like he showed up as they show on the Netflix thing, was shocked and was scared. And, you know, he says in some interviews that he was shaking. It, it was that they all knew this was happening and they knew why it was happening. And then, they, and then the judge actually says beyond the meeting thing, she said it was a business arrangement. And she says that Donaghy was, quote unquote, more culpable than Batista and Martino. Right. And the reason I'm upset at the Netflix people and the whistleblower people is because they knew all of this. These th the, the whistleblower was 2019. This is now, you know, 2022. And I gave them all this stuff. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't need to be a part of these things. That's the, some people think that's what this is. That, I'm, I'm, I'm background for all sorts of documentaries all the time. That's not the issue. I can't imagine that people ignore truth and history for the sake of a sensational narrative. I'll never understand that. Listen, I'm not comparing this to the OJ murders because people actually died in that and it was way worse. But if OJ was out there for the last 13 years with his version of what happened and we knew it wasn't true and they made documentaries and podcasts with this OJ version that wasn't true, I feel like people would care. And because this is lower stakes, I get it. But just that it got to the point of a Netflix documentary. My my last question, um, why didn't Donahue just admit what he did? Why didn't he just say he was a crooked ref and just explain the process? Why did he commit to this narrative of, no, I actually, I didn't bet on my own games. It was actually, I'm just this magical handicapper with all my inside knowledge and I didn't do it. And they threatened my life. And how does this make it better for him? Wouldn't it make more sense to actually just explain to people what you did? I'm a scumbag. I had a huge gambling problem. That's why I did it. I know I shouldn't have, but here are all the things you could look for for rep. Like, there is there's a better, al more altruistic version for this to play out. And instead, he just picked the scumbag route again. 
I have done hundreds of these, Bill, and you're the first person to ask me that question. And it's a great question. His answers are twofold. Number one, he would tell you if you can get in his head, because he writes about this in his book and he talks about it frequently. His father's only worry was that he was fixing games. Well, we should mention his father was a very well respected ref. Well regarded, yeah. exactly. Yeah, like he, I know people who love his father. I mean, very well regarded person. Yeah, uh, that's number one. But the second thing is, and this is where my background in criminology comes in. If he had ever admitted to fixing games, his criminal culpability goes through the roof. He only admitted to betting on his own games for a handful of games in the 0607 season. If he actually pleaded guilty to A, fixing games, and B, going back to the 0307 season, the way that fraud is charged is it's on the loss to the victims. Well, Bill, think, oh, about, wow. think about calculating the loss. If you could actually show, and I, I argue I do this in Game in the Game, that an NBA official was fixing games for four seasons, yeah, you're, you're not just talking about you know ticket holders. You're talking about TV revenues, <laughs> managers, players who are playoff shares contract. for players. Oh, yeah, it would, it would the, the numbers would be astronomical, and so it's definitely in his interest legally to say no, no, no. I was just betting, and it was oh six oh seven. Wow. I, well, the crazy thing is he worked the oh seven playoffs. And he was in that famous Suns Sun Spurs series that the Spurs ended up winning. That um, I have some. I was on record writing pieces about he refed one of the games. I was talking about how terrible the officiating was in the game. He was one of the refs, but we don't know if he affected any playoffs. We don't have any data with that. But anyway, no, no. listen, I'm really glad we got this. We got this out there, and more importantly, if people want to go and pick up your book, which they can get, it's on Kindle. Um, you can get the hardcover, you can listen to it. Like it's, there's an audio version of it, but it's really interesting. And most of it's about Batista and what it's like, you know, for this career gambler and how he kind of rose to whatever prominence he had in that industry. But then you had this whole Donahue piece. You didn't even realize you were going to, and that, then that became a big part of the last half of the book. Well, and importantly, with regard to that, that half of the book, yes, I was the first person to speak to Batista, but with anything of controversy with the NBA betting scandal, you get all three participants' versions of events. I wanted someone, when they re read the book 50 years from now, and they say, okay, well, I want to know about the NBA betting scandal. I want them to pick up game in the game because, like, for instance, the profits. Donaghy says he, he earned thirty to 40000 Martino yeah. says he paid him one hundred and fifteen to one hundred and twenty. And Mar and uh, Batista says that he paid him two hundred and one to two hundred nine. I don't take a position on that. I just tell the public this is what they say, and you know it is what it is. So if you could ask Donahue one question, what would it be? Did you stop gambling on March eighteenth, two thousand and seven? Well, we kind of know he didn't, right? I know, but I want to hear. Not one person of the thousands of interviews he's done has asked him that question, and I would. I just want to see it. I'd want to know. Did you stop gambling? during the 2007 playoffs. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a good one too. Oh, well, listen, by the way, I, if you want to get into this, I, I also want to ask him if he actually was betting on his own games before 2003, which I strongly believe he did. All right, there but you I go. Only, I, only, I only wrote what I could demonstrate. Sean Patrick Griffin, I, I wish we had done this sooner. I'm sad that we had to do it at all, but I'm glad we did it. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. 